So good morning again for everybody who was here already. Uh, you you know the drill. Uh, um, we uh, have on GitHub all the relevant lectures here. We have our notebooks in the different parts, and we have uh, so all the lectures recorded and they are recorded on the YouTube channel from Sergey. So welcome to the quantitative electron microscopy lecture. So a word to how the machine learning workshop is uh, or lecture series is, is constructed. We first focus on what we data we can uh, acquire and analyze with STEM, and then we go more and more into the machine learning aspects with that. Uh, the main question is, or the first question is, why do it quantitatively? Uh, we want to compare it with theory and simulations, so the better we can compare that, the more confidence we have in that, so the theory um, will be, uh, comparison with theory will be enhanced by doing quantitatively. But even if you want to do it with different methods, materials, instruments on different days, then you want to have that quantitatively so that you know um, and can, can um, how well they compare and how well, uh, uh, how good your data are. And that even relies to or relates to parts of the data sets. And so the quality of the data can be assessed with it. We all do it on a quantum mechanical level. And so if we know what kind of um, intensity we have, then we can also relate back on is the uh, noise level adequate or not. We said we get some good training data sets, we survive applicability, and we can uh, get the right policy and reward, a reward for our um, uh, machine learning uh, approach uh, methods. So what is the problem? Uh, So the problem is that electrons interact very, very strongly with matter. This is, of course, also an advantage because it makes electron microscopy also one of the most uh, sensitive and precise methods. So a very complicated and very complex data uh, that we can glean with uh, or, or acquire with electron microscope is basically uh, ideal for machine learning. So there are many opportunities that you can um, um, enhance your data acquisition and analysis with machine learning. But they have to be as good as possible. So it means you have to be quantitative. And that is the whole lecture here today. And we do that with ah, no. Okay. Whatever my computer does today is not good. <laughs> so Quantification means we need to know how many electrons are available. Electrons can be measured in uh, uh, in in picoamps, in number of electrons, in coulomb per second. But in the end, we want to be number of electrons. Uh, 
if we do not have our microscope calibrated well enough, then we are related back to counts. But if we have counts, then we still can, can work with that because, and we will do that today, we will look for our cross-section. That means cross-section, we were talking about it last time. Cross-section is the probability. The probability for some interaction to occur. Uh, and if we do that correctly, then we get that in eels with an aerial density with atoms per square nanometer. So our intensity is say related to the number of atoms, right? Per, per square nanometer, per, per any kind of area. Then we have a probability and we have our intensity where we come into uh, say, into the sample. And once we have, so we, 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 we say initial intensity, we uh, <clears throat> excite an atom and it can be uh, in the core shell or in one of the valence states. So we excite that. And uh, so this is the cross section we are, we are looking for. The cross sections are normally uh, done in, uh, so we are here now in barns. Bonds are about 10 to minus 10, or, or exactly 10 to minus 10 square nanometer. So we measure the probability with the apparent size of our target. So for the ones who are not so familiar, maybe coming from a different area, let's assume we are playing uh, soccer. So we have a ball. We shoot at a, at a goal. If you have a professional, this goal is basically 100%, especially without a goalie. If uh, you have me doing that, the goal becomes much smaller just because my probability to hit that is uh, getting, um, is, is not longer 100%. So it's about the probability uh, of exciting something. And if we look at quantification and we look into the uh, handbook of uh, quantification, I, I don't remember where it comes from. We have two different uh, spectroscopy methods that we have available in the electron microscope. So one is the electron energy loss spectroscopy. And there it's, uh, the quantification is about uh, one to two percent with standards and without standard 10 to 20 percent and the detection limit is about 10 to minus 21 gram. Uh, we will see that that is not necessarily the right thing or and uh, the spatial resolution or lateral resolution it claims that it is about one nanometer. That is obviously also not longer adequate because we do that much better. Um, the accuracy in EDS, in energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy is uh, nominally uh, better. This is however, especially in TEM, not really correct. And the detection limits can be much lower. Uh, according to that, however, that is also not quite correct. And the reason for that is that energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy is uh, a secondary one. So first you have to ex uh, lose the energy and you can measure that with electron energy loss spectroscopy. And after you have excited some atom or number of atoms, then uh, say secondary relaxation process of relaxation of the atom will, uh, will emit a photon in the X-ray and that is then the yield. This yield 
is another factor that has to be added to the cross section of the initial excitation. So there is some uh, discrepancy between what I see and uh, what what is out in the literature. So we'll see how uh, well I can convince you that uh, what's really going on here. So what's really uh, first an example. Uh, this is a nanohorn, or actually there are two nanohorns. Here's one and here's one. Uh, they are like silicon, uh, like like uh, carbon nanotubes. There is some silicon dioxide around here. If we look at the diffraction pattern, we do uh, look at Fourier spectra here. So we have two uh, diffraction points here, and so there is about the fifteen percent tilt. And so we have uh, the reason for this Moray pattern that we see in this carbon nanohorn. The question now is, what is this little bright spot here? And if we do electron energy loss spectroscopy, and in my thing, there's all this thing here. Uh, of that one. So we see in electron energy loss spectroscopy, we have a little bit of intensity. This intensity is exactly where silicon is. And both the intensity in the C contrast image here and in the eels here says there is uh, a silicon atom. And if we quantify that, we can actually do that, then we see it is, uh, I think it was 0.95 of uh, one atom. So it's it's exactly one because we don't have fractions of atoms. Obviously, this is the signal of a single atom. Obviously, very noisy, but there are not very many atoms involved in that experiment. We'll see more examples like that as we go along. And that means that we see a single atom, and that means our detection limit is actually in the 10 to minus 23. Not always. So obviously, if your sample doesn't allow for that, your sample is thicker, things will change. Um, but for modern microscopes with extremely thin sample, we get that kind of uh, resolution. So we can do electron energy loss spectroscopy on a single atom. The conventional analysis of core loss spectra will be uh, like that. So in the area before the core loss edges, so here is our edge. This is the tail of the plasmon peak, of the volume plasmon peaks that we normally have. Uh, we have a core loss edge, so it's an excitation of the core state up into the next free one, which is the conduction band. And then we have um, high above the conduction band, so orders of 50, 100 EV above that. Uh, so we use the area before this edge to extrapolate the background all the way to the end of the spectrum, or at least to wherever this um, edge is. And then we integrate over this edge uh, intensity of the background subtraction and compare that to a cross section. This is very error prone because it depends highly on what was happening before of this uh, edge, so there could be carbon contamination, so there could be a change of things, there could be other elements. Um, and what do you do over here? Obviously, there is still some amount of intensity from the uh, titanium, and uh, the question is, how can we do that better? And the idea is to do the model-based uh, analysis here. So what we do is we fit uh, the 
cross section and the background together. You see that the background is suddenly changing. So it's a little bit different now. Uh, and we are using uh, this is, uh, background. All of that will be fitted. The question is, where do you fit that? And the idea here is that you fit everything. So we uh, accept the edge on that because we might not know exactly where that is. Also, there are excitonic effects. And then we exclude the near edge structure. So we exclude these peaks. So wherever there is a lot of structure in our uh, in our in our edges, in our ionization edges, we do not uh, include that in our fit. What we do know, we include. We know we know that we have the background before all the edges. And then we know what the high energy part of the edges is, because that is more or less behaving like a free atom, so like a single atom, and it behaves like a free electron gas continuum. And that is how these cross sections are calculated. So it's a single atom, and we uh, have the free uh, electron gas continuum. So we know the background here, hopefully. So we have to include as much as possible. So here's still some error that we can uh, include. We know uh, the free electron part. So obviously this is not quite uh, with overlapping edges. That is not very clear, but obviously we know exactly what's going on here in the end of the, um, oxygen edge for our analysis we can normally say after 50 ev above the edge onset we have always a continuum that can change but it's uh, uh, some things that we will explore more when we do the notebooks right so if we do that, what do we get? So the intensity of the edge is the number of atoms per an area. So that is the aerial density. An aerial density is actually a thermodynamic uh, value, so we can work with it. Uh, and then we have a probability here that this uh, excitation occurs. So we have the cross section of the edge and we have our initial intensity. So if we express now this intensity of the edge with our fit, then we have a multiplication factor and we have uh, this cross sections that we used. Uh, everything for our experimental conditions, right? So we need to have that for our com, uh, convergence and collection angle and for the energy uh, re relevant to the energy of our spectrum. So let me just be, use our whole spectrum for that. So we have this multiplication factor here and this multiplication factor is say, now directly is the number of elect, uh, number of atoms times the intensity. And if we divided the intensity by the incident electrons or incident current of our electron beam, then we have the fact that this multiplication factor is directly our number of atoms per square nanometer. If we calibrate our cross sections that way. Normally it's in bonds, so we it's 10 to minus 10 uh, uh, nanometer square, so we multiply that uh, accordingly. The relative intensity is of course independent of that, right? So we have the intensity 
uh, incoming intensity, and that just falls out. We have our cross sections of the two edges, and we have our intensity of the two edges. And so if we fit that, we can directly use, even if we don't calibrate anything, we can use this uh, multiplication factors, uh, the relative, the, the ratio of the multiplication factor for our uh, relative uh, composition. The background is one of the biggest problems in that. So the background is at least in, for a good spectrum, it's, it's lower than the signal, but for normal acquisitions, it's in the same order or higher than our signal. So the signal background ratio is definitely a problem for any of the yields quantifications. Um, and there is another program out there, the yields model program. So if you uh, want to double check things, that, that is a very, uh, good way of, of doing that, uh, or you use uh, the notebooks provided here, uh, we use something similar. The difference in the EELS model program is um, a few, and I want to um, point them out. So in the background, you use usually in any of the commercial software, the power law. The power law is just the energy in the power of a negative value r. This value r is in the order of three, somewhere between two and seven, depending on the fit. Uh, but it's supposed to provide a, a model for the tail of this plasma peak. And we know can be proven actually that this uh, power law does not really describe that over long periods, so it's not very good. Uh, the other option is to use a polynomial fit. Um, that is also not very uh, good because sometimes it just will um, behave not in a physical manner. Um, and uh, oscillations or, or kind of weird uh, increases in the uh, in its behavior at, at the tail end of the of the fitting region. Uh, if we do a mixture of those, that uh, proved to be mathematically very stable for the fit. Uh, it's less flexible, so it's much more predictable. And so that is what we are going to use here. Uh, for the cross section, the other ingredients that we need in order to um, look at this yields uh, uh, quantification, uh, there are a few out there. Uh, one is the hydrogenic one and the hot later one. The hot later one is the one that is uh, provided with a GATAN uh, digital micrograph software. Uh, this is tabulated. Uh, this is calculated. And the hydrogenic one is actually really relevant only for K and L edges. That means all the M and N edges that you might want to um, quantify uh, you can more or less uh, forget there is a paper out from Schottschneider and the discrepancy is about 200%. So it's not really very um, useful to, to use the M uh, higher than L edges. For the K edges, all of this agrees L edges are actually modeled after the L edges and uh, you say M and N edges are also very uh, limited for the Hartree's later one in, in its usefulness. Um, what is the biggest problem we have with, so here we have very good K edge, we have a reasonable L edge. For the Hartree's later one, my problem is if I want to fit something, like here we have the titanium L edge, and I need to have the titanium L 
in, uh, cross section out to 600 EV. So it means over uh, 200 if I have a different cross section. I need it for hundreds of EV. And that is not what, say, Hartree uh, Slater ones provide at this point in time. So I resort to the X ray absorption, uh, photoabsorption cross sections from this, and then the part that we need now is the uh, angle dependence, and that is being uh, provided by this paper from Edgerton, ultramicroscopy. And uh, the key thing is that at very low energies, we have a bit problems. However, all the M and N edges at higher edges and, and lower energies, I mean, less than uh, 50 EV, but that is uh, something where everything is a bit uh, dodgy in electron energy loss spectroscopy. So here I can use those very efficiently. Um, so again, the K edges are basically everywhere the same. Uh, the L edges are really not as good as the other ones. M edges are terrible, except for the X-ray photoabsorption spectroscopy. And we need very long energy ranges so that we can determine that. It doesn't help to put uh, power law in the end of the Hartree Slater ones because uh, there is still some deviations from a power law in the cross sections, obviously. So we need long energy ranges for our cross sections, and that's why I'm using this uh, provided by NIST. Another problem is, uh, oh, and this is a bit uh, not very clear here, is the <clears throat> thickness correction. So if you have relatively thick samples, then you have multiple scattering occurring, and that means your core excitations also have low loss spectroscopy. So the plasmon peak is the most prominent excitation in eels. And if we have an uncorrected one, then we have here a silicon in silicon carbide. That is here the red curve. And here the black curve is what's supposed to be representing that. Obviously, there is a problem. If we convolute this cross section with the low loss that we acquired at the same point, then we are back to approximately the shape of this uh, eels uh, ionization edge. And why would that be important? We said we are not using this part, right? So do I contradict myself? And the reason is what I really change is the slope of my cross section here at the higher energies. And so even so, this one is not very, it, it looks good, right? Uh, but it's not important. The important part is that my cross sections in this part here is different. And that is what I'm using for my quantification. So if you want to simulate a silicon carbide sample, they are notoriously sick and we had a very, very hard time. So it's the hardest spectrum I ever had to quantify. So only with the uh, convolution of the cross section with the low loss, it was possible. And if we do not do that, we have a lot of discrepancies in our cross. If we do a, um, a profile across the silicon carbide, silicon dioxide interface, we have some kind of problems and uh, we have not 50% in the silicon to carbide ratio. We don't have the right uh, ratio in the silicon, silicon dioxide one. And from uh, the expectation value from what the transition region should be between silicon carbide and silicon dioxide, uh, it's basically a roughness issue in this case then it doesn't work. However, as soon as we do this uh, quantification, we can be very close to the uh, what, what we get with uh, 
from from the C contrast images, what we would get. So, if what is the problem? Obviously, we have different slopes in our uh, tails of our uh, plasmon peak. So the background of the ionization edges changes rapidly. Uh, we have uh, a very sharp silicon carbide plasmon peak and a relative delayed silicon dioxide plasmon peak. Uh, we also have multiple scattering. So we see we have another peak here. Uh, and when we are looking for the, when we analyze the low loss spectra, we will see this is actually not a very thick sample, uh, probably in the order of about 50 nanometers. So it's not outrageously thick, but already we have very clear and um, consequences from this kind of thickness. Um, now we have to talk about incident beam intensity. So that's the last little bit that we need in order to quantify something. Uh, one thing you can uh, do is we just take an image of our condenser aperture in, in vacuum. So that is all the electrons that <clears throat> reach the sample and that form our, uh, our beam. And we just sum over that. This is a very, um, it's a very good way of, of, of doing that. And to, uh, but only if it is the same camera that you acquire your uh, EELS database, otherwise, uh, you uh, have to be very, very careful with the, with the quantification and conversion to electrons. Um, you can also use the low loss spectrum. Uh, the low loss spectrum has other problems and mostly it's a, it's a time constant. So the low loss spectrum is acquired with a very different timeline. So usually in the order of a few milliseconds. Uh, you can get rid of that kind of time um, inconsistencies or, or um, by, by just defocusing the zero loss peak and acquiring that one. So any of the way you need to determine how many electrons reach the sample and you do that in vacuum. That means there's only one extra data point required, especially for a modern electron microscope where the intensity is extremely stable. Um, on the neon microscopes with a cold field emitter, the intensity is varying all the time, but the low loss spectra that you can acquire with the modern GATAN spectrometer simultaneously to your well loss spectrum will allow you to monitor and uh, uh, at least qualitatively what uh, the, the, the change in the intensity. And over short periods of time, uh, this is normally also not really a problem. So what you need to do is you have to acquire the in or determine the intensity. And if you do that in counts, that's okay, as we will see in a moment, but it has to be the same camera as the yield spectrum. So acquiring a low-low spectrum with it, um, all low spectrum is okay. So detector, obviously you cannot be in uh, an overexposed um, regime. Uh, you have to think about the conversion rate if you want to really uh, quantitatively uh, do things because as soon as you have the number of electrons, then you can go back and actually also analyze the noise. This is not something that is usually done. And so that's why I'm not going into that in this lecture. Um, the efficiency. Efficiency is very uh, important because the dynamic range and the quantum detectum quantum efficiency. So the amount of noise in versus noise out 
is dependent on the dose. And so you have a very high dynamic range, but only at very high count rates do you have a good tantrum quantum efficiency. Again, this is uh, going to be less and less as a problem with the direct detectors. Our detectum quantum efficiency is uh, increasing, especially for the low intensity uh, regime. The other point is the point spread function. In the point spread function, so let's assume we put all our beam in a single pixel. Uh, what your detector will do is it will actually spill some of this intensity on the neighboring pixels, and uh, that is your point spread function. So that is a, a function that will broaden your signal, even though everything is is uh, should be perfect. Uh, again, the better and the newer your detector, the less of a problem this point spread function will be, but it's something one has to take care of. The way it's normally done is by just oversampling your, sample, uh, your, your data. So oversampling the data is something which is um, normally done anyway. It will improve your dynamic range and it will improve the influence of this point spread function. So if, if you're oversampled by much more than your point spread function, this is not longer a problem. So we can get around of all of that. Uh, the only thing that really requires work is this conversion rate. Uh, there is another problem with the uh, with, uh, incident beam, uh, and that is that you're not detecting everything in your yield spectrum. So a lot of electrons are scattered to high angles for thicker samples. If you have a thin sample, this is not uh, really a problem. So minimal amounts are scattered to high angles and we can just ignore that uh, for the most part. For thicker samples, we cannot. And your high angular dark field detector that image will actually show you how big of a current you have, of how many of the electrons are scattered to high angles, and you can calibrate then your yield spectrum accordingly by subtracting these kind of electrons uh, off. So it doesn't mean that that is uh, perfect. This is, again, an approximation that uh, because as you go through the sample, there is a certain amount of energy loss happening, um, but you can correct for that. So <clears throat> in uh, an off-axis cut of the silicon carbide and silicon dioxide, you go across here, we got this uh, very nice and, and very accurate silicon ca uh, to carbon ratio no oxygen or very little oxygen actually. And then we have this transition region here with the roughness. Uh, so with that, we can directly determine the roughness um, and we can do that extremely quantitatively because we can trust this line profiles by uh, and, and we have a very high confidence ratio, uh, confidence into these uh, results. Uh, and we can then combine these two things and we can get the carbon to silicon ratio and we can make different tests on that. And we can be very, very um, um, accurate. If, uh, now we come to the low loss part. How are we in time here? Okay, we're getting a bit behind because of our starting point. So we are starting with the low loss region and we might go through that a little bit faster. The main uh, usage of the low loss is usually uh, thickness measurements. Uh, I want to discourage you to using that uh, at least not quantitatively. Uh, and so what 
is going on. So we know that the multiple scattering is for, uh, following a Poisson ratio. And so if we do the logarithm of the intensity of the uh, uh, total, in, uh, total intensity in the yield spectrum versus the one of the uh, incoming one, then and or and we are using that as the zero loss peak here, then we get uh, the relative thickness in terms of the inelastic mean free pass. The so accuracy, so you're dis dividing two very large numbers. So you have to be as accurate as possible to this to determine that. And then what is this inelastic mean free pass? The inelastic mean free pass is for all practical purposes in the order of about 100 nanometer, just so ballpark number. Uh, but this inelastic mean free pass depends on the collection angle, obviously also on the acceleration voltage. It depends on the uh, refractive index and on the atomic number. And so that's why it is used quantitatively. So this inelastic mean free pass is tabulated, but not probably for the acceleration voltage you are using and most likely not for the collection angles because it is not normally uh, used, uh, tabulated for stem images. Uh, and so this is where the problem comes in. Uh, and so there are some people out there that measure that and the accuracy is very low. It's, however, if you determine the uh, inelastic mean free pass lambda here for your sample and for your experimental conditions, then it can be very, very accurate. But again, it requires some work and uh, uh, <clears throat> In our, in order to do that, you have to determine your, your collection angle. Uh, Pierre Trebia has, uh, Trebia, I don't know, it's French, so I don't exactly know how to pronounce Pierre's name. Uh, so he <clears throat> looked at how to determine the effective collection angle, and he looked in the convolution of the convergence and collection angle for STEM. And uh, I'm using uh, his formulas. Um, and <clears throat> don't trust the approximations of the, of the table. Uh, and, um, and check the tables. Are they adequate for what you're doing? And uh, if they're close, uh, you have some approximations. And then you need to extrapolate the zero loss peak as well. But this uh, <clears throat> extrapolation is usually problematic and uh, we'll see how we can do it better. So my advice for you is don't try to use it quantitatively, use it qualitatively and uh, as we go along, I'll show you how to do a bit more um, use the core level, core uh, ionization edges to do it quantitatively. Um, it is, however, full of information. So we have a lot of information in this low loss part. We have all the optical excitation. So don't dismiss the low loss. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I'm saying just don't use it for um, sickness evaluation. So we use the plasmon energy itself. And so from that, we can actually determine the uh, inelastic mean free pass. Again, there are lots of approximations in here, but that will generally get you to a closer um, result than the rest. Uh, this is an older one. So we need the zero loss EV. We need to fit that zero loss and then we have a single scattering analysis of the blue DNA. We will do that in the notebook. Uh, so what we do is we have a low loss spectrum and then we can get a lot of 
different sickness measurements out of there. And so here we have 0.8 times the relative sickness, and we come up with a plasmon sickness for about 84 nanometer and the inelastic mean free pulse around 100 nanometer. Uh, this is for silicon dioxide for our set walls uh, convergence angle of uh, uh, 10 and a collection angle of about 30 milliradians. So the invective uh, collection angle was 15 milliradians. And so we got uh, our inelastic mean free pass. We do the same thing for silicon carbide. So these things work. However, I would not trust them uh, uh, beyond about 10%, which is already quite good. This doesn't work all the time. Uh, let's look at this kind of spectrum here. This is a low low spectrum. And uh, it's not obvious at all where the plasmon peak is. So if you have a lot of other transitions, interband transitions, plasmon, surface plasmon peaks, you don't really know a priori where your plasmon peak is necessarily. Uh, in this case, it's actually over here. So, and you can look at these plasmons with uh, momentum resolved, and then you can see that uh, we have the plasmon peaks do follow um, no dispersion with 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 quantum uh, with 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 momentum resolved with our Q value for. Very thin specimens that doesn't work anyway because the surface plasmons will steal intensity from the core losses. And uh, so, what we do here is we are looking for, say, and we will do that in our uh, notebooks. So, we have three layers and one layer, uh, single layer has uh, 23 atoms and a triple layer about 60 atoms. So in uh, tungsten disulfide, um, and from the number of atoms, we can actually discriminate between one layer and three layer. Um, and uh, the sulfur edge, which is very delayed, does not provide as much of uh, uh, is not an ideal way of doing that. However, it still works very, very uh, accurately. So the very thin specimen don't work, uh, mostly because of the plasmon, surface plasmons that are activated in that. And so uh, the surface plasmons basically steals the intensity from the bulk plasmons. Uh, and that will make problems. You don't know at which areas it works. So at high energies, you have a lot of problems with uh, uh, multiple scattering in low loss spectroscopy and sickness uh, determination at lower ones. Oh, okay. Let's see why we want to do that. So why do we want to measure the sickness at all? The key thing is if you have a nanoparticle, you want to know is that uh, round? Does it have a flat? Is it flattened? So what is the shape of that? And the thickness, of course, will directly tell you that. The expansion in the x and y direction is trivial from the image. Uh, and if we do a thickness map, then we see, yes, indeed, this thing is 75 nanometer thick. Uh, and here we use the iron area density. Uh, and the oxygen aerial density will show us uh, a similar one. So this is uh, iron oxide, and we see, okay, this is actually a spherical particle. Um, we can do more than that. We can actually look at the pressure that are in uh, uh, gas bubbles. So here we have argon gas bubbles uh, in a bulk metallic glass that was irradiated. And these argon bubbles, we can actually, by measuring the argon uh, intense, uh, 
aerial density and knowing, okay, we assumed here that these bubbles are spherical, which uh, is from um, established from, from other uh, methods. We can determine how many argon atoms are in here. And we have uh, something like 20 atoms per square nanometer. If we put that into the ideal gas la uh, law, then we can determine the pressure. We uh, did that also on uh, and sil uh, silver M edges, similar things, determining the thickness. And with the silver M edge, it's an, normally we wouldn't be able to do that very accurately. Again, we get uh, very good results and uh, agree um, agreement between the thickness and the uh, spherical particles that we have here. Uh, so we do the thickness quantification here. Uh, we get the volume density uh, of cobalt. In this case, we have an aerial density that we measure and all we have to do is determine the thickness is we divide the aerial density by the uh, volume density. We are left over with <clears throat> our thickness in nanometer. And in this case, it was uh, 3.8 nanometer. So even for very, very small particles, we can get that. Um, and that was actually a triangle and we can determine that on top of say silver, and we can do that in, in complicated structures as well. So it's very precise and it's very versatile. Uh, for the low loss spectra, what we did, we were also uh, quantifying the low loss by fitting the whole spectra. Um, <clears throat> um, so, the complete low loss was uh, fitted with uh, different structures. Uh, so we have mostly Gaussians here for the surface plasmon area, and we have Gaussians for interband transitions. Uh, we have a zero loss peak, and we have the true disease. Uh, with the position, we can determine then very accurately what are the surface plasmon peaks and where are those peaks exactly? So we have not only that, so we have an area that gives us an intensity. So it gives us a probability and we have the quantitatively. So we know exactly what the uh, um, quantitative analysis is, or is it in, uh, quantitatively the intensity of this, this plasmon peaks. And so we can see whether they are relevant or not with their spatial distribution. For the thickness, we can calibrate that with uh, convergent beam electron diffraction. Um, we don't have time to go into that, but the main thing is we have the ability to do quantification. It's not so much trouble uh, I rely more on the core structures than on the low loss structures, and the low loss structures we use mostly for um, excitonic and plasmonic effects. And again, having that quantitatively, we can compare that then to theory. Uh, there's more in eels. Uh, we'll look into that a little bit more. So that is the same one we were talking in the second lecture. Uh, the main difference to uh, the optical response is actually the momentum transfer, right? So there is a difference between the visible one and the yield spectra. And that is mostly the momentum transfer. Visible light is not having any kind of um, distribution in, in, in momentum. Uh, and eel stars have said, and uh, if you want to get close to the optical response, you have to severely restrict your uh, 
collection angle, so that the effective collection angle is very small, or you go in parallel elimination where you have very little convergence angle, and then you have to even more restrict, uh, then you can even more restrict your effective collection angle by getting there. So that is an experimental setup problem that you have to solve in order to get to the real optical response. All of that is uh, improved with uh, monochromated eels. So uh, in uh, here at UT Knoxville and in Oak Ridge, we have uh, several monochromated electron microscopes. And uh, that, of course, cuts out from the distribution of the electron source a very small amount that is uh, then giving us the energy resolution in the low loss and in the core loss. And then we can actually look at, uh, this is an interface plasmon here that uh, creates a hotspot at this dual particles here. And we have uh, <clears throat> now this intensity uh, is calibrated as we saw before by fitting the, the low loss spectra in this spectrum image. Um, I had some questions in the second lecture on the near structure and core loss. So uh, I go a little bit back now in, in that. And so we are exciting core shell electron up into the conduction band. That is <clears throat> due to the dipole selection rule the site and momentum resolved density of state. So it's not only localized, it is also momentum resolved. And that means from the 1S state, I go into the P state, but from the 2P state, I can go into the S and D state. So the edges will look different just because of this dipole selection rule. Uh, and so we start with full core shell, we get this core shell up into the conduction band. <clears throat> and that looks now very similar to doping. So the simulation of the near structure is therefore dependent on this uh, uh, core shell excitations. And we have the C plus one approximation. We have real excitation theory, GW, where we can uh, very well get an idea of what this uh, near edge structure should look like. Um, the, I there was some question about the, the chemical shift. Here's the kappa L23 edge. And uh, here is the kappa 2 oxygen. Kappa 2 oxygen has a band gap, but what we see is that this band gap is not really changing. Uh, in uh, copper oxide, so if the copper is further oxidized, actually we have a shift to lower energies. That means the energies of these edges are not very well preserved with composition. Uh, and what you would expect is <clears throat> that this copper, so if we open up the bank gap, right? So you would expect that this energy shifts up. And so the distance between that was the to P3 half to the conduction band is actually increasing. Actually, it does decrease. Um, the reason is that this core uh, states actually can uh, shift as well. So we have this core level shift. That is what you measure with XPS usually, uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And so we have two, uh, contribution, main contribution to the uh, edge onset. One is the opening up of the bank gap. The other one is the uh, core level shifts here. Uh, both contribute to the exact position. Uh, and in the case of the kappa two oxide, it is actually shifted, uh, uh, stays the same. So it's the opening up of the uh, bank gap is compensated and it's overcompensated in the kappa oxide. So both things happen. Uh, the shifts are usually in the order of uh, 
a few EV, the most extreme one is probably silicon dioxide. The silicon edge shifts by about seven EV. So what does it really look like? So here is kappa. Um, in the kappa edge, we D-bands are filled. And so we have here this free electron-like uh, parabolas that we all used to from physics, right? Uh, that are called Van Hove singularities. And these Van Hove singularities will give rise to these little bumps here. Say onset, so we cut here through this big parabola here. This onset will give rise to the first peak. So we have usually cutting uh, through a parabola, and that will give us a sort of like edge, and then as a small fun, hopefully singularities will give uh, little bumps of the transitions. If the Fermi level goes down and reaches the um, the, the D bands, then we have very strong energies in the density of state and we get these so-called white lines and these white lines. So if we, the Fermi level would be about here, we would see this uh, uh, D bands uh, very strongly in our structures. So that would be so in our uh, strontium titanate, titanium LH, these very strong peaks there. So that are the white lines. Uh, and if we look back here, then we see if we have a 2P, uh, so L3 edge, we have the 2P3 half, so the four electrons in the initial states, and the 2P1 half, the L2 edge, will be two. So the L2 to L3 should be 0.5. Let's remember that because we will investigate that in our uh, notebooks. I already tell you this is not going to be preserved. And the ratio will tell you something about the symmetry of the atom, while the total intensity of the energies of, of the white lines will tell you something about the occupancy of the D states in your uh, sample. And the D states is uh, very important for magnetic properties, correlated effects, and so on. So we really want to know that. The shape and the feature sharpness is given by the lifetime engineered structure. Uh, we have the core lifetime that will give you already an, an <clears throat> uh, make the uh, best resolutions that you can achieve. So it's about 0.1 EV for relative low lying edges up to two EV in the higher ones. And uh, so that's, let's say six, 700 EV uh, edges. And the other thing is anything beyond your edge, you see how that is washed out. So the first one is relatively sharp. The second one is kind of sharp. And then it uh, the sharpness of the features uh, reduces because if you, have excited an electron up here, it will fall down to the bottom of the conduction band very quickly. And this <clears throat> short uh, lifetime with the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty relationship will give you to broadening and this broadening is directly visible. Um, so, L to three ratio or L to three edges are uh, very prominent, easy to far, easy to uh, determine. And if you have the energy resolution, you can actually look at the crystal field splitting. That is given by the uh, deformation of the octahedral site in for the titanium here, and you see we have a splitting like this and a splitting like that. So we have two different information in rutile and inertase, and they can be directly used as a fingerprint to discriminate that. And we actually did that even in, in amorphous material. Just to stop with uh, uh, nice pictures. So we have an iron in graphene. 
we can do an yield spectrum of the single atom, noisy, but now we know, oh, here are these white lines he was talking about. And we can <clears throat> look at that. So we have C contrast image, we have the uh, eels, and they correlate obviously. And uh, actually, an analysis of the white line ratios will show us or showed us that this uh, iron atom is actually more magnetic than, than in soft magnetic material. So we have chemical composition. We have, uh, we haven't talked much about that, but uh, the lighter element is much better in eels and in EDS. Uh, that is mostly because of the dead layer in the EDS detectors. Uh, we have information about the uh, bonding and optical properties and energy filtered imaging. So I was focusing here on how to do it quantitatively. And the main thing here is to get say uh, quantitative analysis. And so we uh, is acquiring the initial currents that hits your sample. And then with probabilities that we're using, we can go on and do Um, uh, all we need is the initial current, and then with the probabilities, we can do quantitative analysis of that, so that we can compare to simulations and other uh, techniques. So uh, let's look whether we had some... Uh, in the chat. Okay, a lot of uh, things are already answered. Questions are answered by Sergei. Let's see. Um, whether we have any uh, ones that were not answered. Okay. So maybe we, I have a, a look at that while we're doing our notebooks. And so if you answer your question, uh, if you have your questions uh, while we are going through the notebooks, then we can maybe answer them directly on, on the data sets, okay? In order to go to the notebooks, we go to lecture three uh, and we first do the low loss. In the low loss, we are clicking on the open in collab. And as we always have to do that in, uh, in Google Colab, we have to install all our uh, packages. Again, this is a PyTem lib. Um, I'm having installed the newest version so that um, Okay, everything is downloading and, and installing. We have to wait for that, otherwise it's, it's not working. Uh, as I said, so we'll, uh, in this notebook, we will look at the Bruder theory. Uh, what's the Drude theory? So the Drude theory is about the volume plasmon. Uh, if we make a Gedanken experiment and we take an electron, this electron is far away from the sample. And then because it is almost three quarters of the speed of light, you place it very, very suddenly in the sample. All the valence electrons will of course be repelled from this electron. And so, the electron density changes a little bit. And then because it is very fast, you put it away very quickly. 
what happens is the valence electrons will go back to their original state, but they will do that in an oscillatory kind of manner. And that means you are exciting this plasmon, this quasi particle of the uh, valence electrons, uh, like, like a bell ringing. And this uh, has been, um, so it's just a, a motion and a, a quantum mechanic oscillator. And so it rooted it said as a first very early on. Okay, no questions yet. So the next thing is we download our sample spectrum, it's just an aluminum one. Um, we will go through that relatively quickly. And once we have downloaded that one, we install our uh, we, 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 yeah we install the, the packages. So what you should have at this point in time should have an extra folder over here with the example data, and we should have an aluminum sample. Uh, if you click on the table of contents, you see we are at the load and plot spectrum part. Uh, what we do is we open, like in last time, the file widget, we go to our example data, we click on the aluminum uh, sample spectrum, and we select that as main, very simple. And we plot this sample. Okay, good morning. Oh. We have to enable that. Oh, shoot. No, it's not the newest one. Something has not been uh, done. Okay, let's uh, click on the left hand, uh, right hand side here on insert and run the collab. And then we have to run the top one again. And now we have our spectrum. Uh, the spectrum consists of a zero loss peak. No. This is uh, not at zero exactly. So we have a little bit of deviation that is um, quite normal with this with eels, so that's why it is very a good idea always to acquire the low loss spectrum together with the core loss. So you see this small deviations of something like, let's say 0.2 EV. Uh, and if we go and look at the low intensity here and we need, we have a very high dynamic range here. What do we have in this case? We have some interband transitions over here. It's a metal, so we have lots of interband transitions. Uh, so that must be some kind of uh, strong, stronger interband transition, or maybe even a surface plasmon from the two different sides. So that was a aluminum film. We have our plasmon peak. It's very, very uh, sharp in aluminum. And we have our second plasmon peak. Uh, so this is due to the multiple scattering. Um, so we fit our zero loss peak first. And we do that by fitting a product of two Lorentzians to it. And we can see how well our fit works here. And it usually works perfectly. So this fit does more than that. So it also put it perfectly on the origin of our energy scale at zero. And we have uh, our metadata and we have the sum of the zero loss peak is about. Okay, uh, we have a thickness of 0.75. Uh, and uh, we two percent 
uh, is uh, the, the height of the sample. So we divided our sample by its own intensity so that we have an idea of the scattering probability. So we have about 0.75% here. Uh, the metadata, everything is uh, stored there. And now we fit the Drudy theory. The energy loss spectrum or the energy loss spectrum, uh, the loss spectrum, not the energy loss spectrum, the loss spectrum is the imaginary part of uh, minus one over the dielectric function. The dielectric function is where all the optical uh, properties of material are, are stored. And uh, uh, that's a complex function. So it's not a dielectric constant, it's a dielectric function. And it's the uh, most prominent one is a plasmon frequency. And um, with its uh, width of the plasmon peak, the plasmon frequency itself or plasmon energy uh, is actually directly related to the number of electrons here uh, and the dampening of that is uh, giving you idea of the conductivity. So all of those are important. We are not going too much into that. That will take too long. Uh, I just wanted to show you that we can uh, use the plasmon to fit uh, to use the through the theory to fit this uh, plasmon peak. Uh, so here, let's go. Let's see snippets here. Uh, so let's look at the Rudy theory and the plasmon peak. The difference shows you very clearly. We have said fitted nicely. Uh, now we know the position, and we know actually also the amount. Uh, of the, the cross section here. So we did that quantitatively immediately just because we know how many electrons were involved here relatively. So through the theory itself uh, fits the dielectric function to that. So here is the dielectric function. So it's a real part and the imaginary part. And if we zoom in here, where we go through zero with uh, uh, real part, we see this is the ringing of our electron gas, uh, and it's very narrow, uh, undamped in a free electron gas like aluminum, and it's relatively sharp here. Okay. So it's not much broadening due to the uh, lifetime. Um, the lifetime, by the way, is the oscillations are in the order of less than one, so it's heavily damped normally. Um, the next thing is we want to look at the multiple scattering. Uh, if we look at the multiple scattering, we have here our first plasmon peak, and here we have the second one. If we reduce that even to very thin specimen, point one, please check it out, try it yourself. Uh, we have always a little bit of a second plasmon peak here independent of uh, how thin the specimen is. So we have always a probability to scatter, scatter multiple times. And, and we talked about it last time. For six samples, we can directly try that as well. Two times in elastic mean three parts, we get this uh, series of plasmon peaks. So it's a plasmon peak scattered with a plasmon peak. So it's a convolution, another convolution. So it gets broader and broader and the distance is um, always doubled. If we use that for our plasmon peak, then we can fit our whole spectrum with uh, say multiple scattering. So we have the zero loss peaks that we fitted first, then we have the plasmon peak, and now we have the second plasmon peak as well that we fitted. And so this is going back in our 
Um, to our formulas, we can now extract all the information that uh, we have uh, talked about it earlier. Uh, another way of, of doing it is trying to reduce the uh, the also uh, deconvolute the multiple scattering. So it is a Poisson statistics. So we can do that with a Fourier log deconvolution. Uh, and if we deconvolute that, we can, we have our zero loss peak that of course does not change. Uh, okay. And we look very carefully here. We see what changes with the single scattering deconvolution, the intensity of uh, the second peaks here is going into the plasmon peak. Uh, and in the first peak, so all the intensity from the higher orders goes back into our first peak. So that one gets higher and the second plasmon peak uh, disappears. So. I did a trick here and is that I did not use um, a zero loss peak and I'm using here a Gaussian to convolute my resolution. If I use something with a very small or enhanced resolution, you might want to do that and you might think that is a good idea. Then um, you can see looks good in the moment, but if you look very carefully, you see that due to the Fourier analysis of that, you will get uh, a lot of swingings uh, and oscillations into that analysis, and uh, it uh, actually does not buy you anything. Uh, so due to the noise, noise propagation, you cannot get much better than the analysis we did for the zero loss peak was about uh, 0.8, uh, 0.18 EV energy resolution. So if we go to 0.2, we are on the safe side and we can actually get um, single scattering deconvoluted image uh, spectrum and uh, we get uh, no kind of enhanced noise with that. So that is one of the key points when you do the single scattering deconvolution. So the low loss spectra are actually, okay, well, uh, that's gonna have some uh, ask the question. So let's, let's look at that when we do the core loss spectra in the next part. So, um, <clears throat> We have to look at the low loss spectra in terms of electrodynamics. Uh, we can get a lot of information about the sickness. As I said, be careful with it, but plasmon frequency, plasmon widths, band gap, dielectric functions, all of these things can be determined. And the key things are that in the low loss spectrum, you don't have to worry too much about your quantification because you have basically the number of electrons involved in the spectrum directly there, and you can just divide that by that. Uh, let's go and look at the core loss spectra. We have another half an hour. So we go to our machine learning workshop. We go to lecture three, and now we go to the core loss spectra. And uh, Asan, you have to wait a little bit for the L2, L3 ratio. So again, as before, we have to first install. Good morning. Ah, I'm stupid. Hold on. We have to open it in Colab, of course, first, before we can operate anything by pressing the button. Now we can run it. And it's already, no, it's not installed. 
So we're installing that. So here we now look at the poor loss spectra. If you want to know more about it, we have done quantitative analysis in 2019. We have done a bit more since then, and we made this now available on um, in Google Colab. And hopefully you find it convenient. So you have to download all the different packages. Okay, we are done. Now we can download our spectra. And if we've done it correctly, then we have all of them saved in the example data. Okay. Okay, so we load our packages. Connect to the Google Drive. Okay, well, we don't have to do that really uh, because we have our spectra here in the example data. And we open the file widget. Okay. Go to the example data. And the first thing I want you to open is uh, the first one here, the choir core loss. And we select that as main. And in the low loss spectrum, I want you to add that spectrum. So now we have here two spectra, the high loss and the low loss. If we load the spectrum, we see our color spectrum and we see our low low spectrum. With this info widget here, we can change that backwards and forward. We see the offset and so on. Um, we have here selected the low low spectrum. And if we look here carefully, then we see that uh, the exposure time here is saying 63 seconds. Um, and this exposure time is for the whole series of that. But what we really did is we did single exposure time of 0.01, 21 times. So we have our exposure time of 0.21. We have to add that here. If we change that, then now we go to the Follow spectrum. And if we select for the quantification, our low low spectrum with the right exposure time. And now we go to probability. We see that we have uh, starting with a probability of one parts per million. Okay. So one parts per million of the electrons are going to be scattered into this few layers of boron nitride. What I want to do with you is I want to figure out how many layers of boron nitride do we have. And at this point, I don't want to change anything there. Uh, the auto quantification does not work for this sample. You can try it. But if we go for the composition widget, now we can look at that. Uh, the first edge is boron, that would be the atomic number five. It will set the onset for that edge. It's 188, it's over here. Oh, so you see on the bottom, it's 188. So this is our boron edge. And if we do the second edge, oops, doesn't matter. We go to the second edge and set is at 400. The second edge is nitrogen, 400 EV. For both of them, we exclude about 5 EV in the front and 50 EV in the back. So let's look at that. So we show our edges. These are our edges. We have the nitrogen edge and we have the boron edge. And uh, if we look at the fit area on the top, it tells us where we uh, have our fit area and what we exclude. Without doing anything, we can just press the quantification button. Let's do that. Okay. And then in the output of result, we can look at that and we get 
a credible result, right? So it's boron nitride 50%. Is that quantitative? Well, yes and no, right? If we press the probability button, then we see that there are 118 atoms per square nanometer. And if we add a code cell here, we did say aerial density, right? So 118 divided, and I know that uh, boron nitride has 18 boron atoms per square nanometer per monolayer. So that would give us the number of monolayers. Uh, comma here. So there would be six and a half monolayers. That is not what we found. And there are a few problems with this spectrum. So let's go back here and look at the, this one here. First of all, nobody in the same mind would uh, collect this spectra with 200 kV. So this is wrong. Uh, I did that on purpose so that you see how we can be quantitative and what kind of pitfalls are there. And the collection angle is actually 40. So I know my experimental conditions and I look at them and I want to see how that changes now my quantification. Okay. Um, I have to activate that just by going somewhere else or pressing enter. So now we have this and we do a quantification again. And now we have 60 atoms per square nanometer. That is half. So about three monolayers. That is much closer to what we had in our uh, image. So it was like in the other case, it was rolled up. And so it was just three layers of boron nitride. Close. There's still a little bit of a problem. And if you look at the nitrogen edge, uh, 64, and uh, again, still we have a relative, I would guess, 51 to 84, credible allowance for, the, for an eel's edge, right? Uh, one thing we normally do is we are reducing the starting edge and we are trying not to go all the way to the end. We do a quantification now, it reduces it a little bit more. The reason, okay, that's a bit too much. So it should not deviate that much here from, from that. So we make a, okay, this is, this is better. So we have uh, recovered the slope of our spectrum. So here is our fitted spectrum. But what we see is the nitrogen edge is completely off. Um, we go up here again. What we do is we select from the boron edge all the way out to the nitrogen edge on that. Okay, it's here. So we are 188, and the nitrogen edge, however, in boron nitride is at 400. And if you press on the energy scale, you will see how the dispersion changes and the offset. So our energy scale is now changed and we have um, a not very well calibrated energy scale on that microscope. Uh, and it's a point, it's about 3% uh, off here. We do a quantification now, H1 is 61, H2 is 60. And we are trusting the boron edge a little bit. Oh, okay, we are, let's look at that a bit closer. So we have here, our boron edge is, is, is looking okay, of course, right? Let's look at that. So the edge on that is correct. We don't trust anything in the uh, near edge structure region with a lot of features. We fit that part here, we fit the front with our cross sections. Uh, if we go back and look at the nitrogen, we have a similar thing. And we see that 
said. Even so, we have a very noisy spectrum. We get our calibration here correctly and our output is 50-50 with about discrepancy of 0.4%. Uh, and that is without any changes or uh, <clears throat> calibration. Of course, it's a very thin specimen, so we have very little assumptions made here. And our H1 is that we trust more than the H2, so we have 61. And if we press set one, 61. So we have about three monolayer. So quantitatively, we are very, very close. Um, we have all of that stored automatically in the data. And we can look at the low loss uh, in the, uh, the near structure. And we will do that more in the next one. We have about 15 more minutes. The key thing is we have to put the fit end here. And if we press the smooth button, what we get? No? Oh, okay, here we are. We have our <clears throat> near structure now without any kind of noise by fitting just a whole bunch of different um, Gaussians into that. And we first subtracted our models that we had before, so our cross-section. Um, we have a whole bunch of number of peaks here, which we can now find. We have them here, and we can fit them on here. And we see with, with seven peaks, we have already, uh, in our model, we have a decent representation of our near its structure. And of course, because we know the exact position and amplitude uh, and the uh, full width half maximum, we have said, uh, can directly compare that. Let's do the same thing now with a different spectrum. Mm. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, it's two hours, so, okay, people are moving. Now we come to the, let's just to, don't have any confusion. Uh, let's use the strontium titanate spectrum and select that as main. And we want to have a low loss spectrum and we want to have the image of our, um, condenser aperture. So that will give us the intensity. This will give us the distribution in the low loss. The low loss is uh, much lower. What um, was, was done separately. So we, we have to do that here. So if we look at that spectrum, we are now having strontium titanate spectrum we are using the sum of the image of the condenser aperture for looking at the probability. <clears throat> and we see immediately that even though we have a higher energy, we have a higher probability for our selection. That is due to the larger thickness. So obviously we don't have a very thin specimen here. Uh, and we don't have any problems with that one. And uh, the data set is there. So the auto quantification will give us a credible composition, but we want to see what that is doing and it actually also does realize what the titanium and oxygen 
are in present in that spectrum. If we do a composition widget, uh, again, uh, we can just do a quantification. And obviously that is what the thing did. Before, uh, in this case, we can look here. This was done at 200 kV. The collection angle was 100 milliradians in the conversion angle. So it was in TM, done in TM mode. Uh, there was one question before, right? So the energy dispersion, uh, so the spatial resolution is not that great, but uh, you have very clear defined angles. Um, we have two problems here. One is that there's obviously something uh, wrong with our detector here. We have this problem for some time. And so we have to stop our analysis at about 620 in this case. And we have some problems in the beginning. So we start at something like 350. And then we have quantification and we get composition that is much closer to what we expect. So titanium, O3, so <clears throat> we should have 25% titanium and oxygen 77. Now, we can do a little bit better. So we can look at the probability. So here we have about 500 atoms per square nanometer, but if we look at this cross section, we see that this cross section is actually not very correct since, uh, especially for the zero low, uh, for, for this peak here. So we have a low low spectrum. And if we do the convergence with the low low spectrum, before you press the quantification button, please see how this. Uh, watch how this changes when you press the quantification button. Push down here, right? So again, it changes mostly what we are interested in, say slope here and here. And we have now 638 atoms. And if we divide it, by one over, uh, divided by the volume density, which is divided by one atom per the unit cell, which is <clears throat> then a multiplication 3904 and cubed. And that would be then in nanometer. Ah, same mistake, we need a comma. So we have about uh, 40 nanometer of uh, sample thickness here, and, and that's what we about guess. So we have quantification. How good is the quantification now? 23 to 76. So this is, uh, maybe if we go here, I'm not sure if there's a little bump here. So maybe we go a bit closer. We see what our changes are. And yeah, so within 2% for these overlapping edges, that's all you get. The next thing is we want to look here in our difference, what kind of peaks do we have here for our near edge structure? So we do the same thing as we did before. And we look uh, in the near edge structure and fit the peaks into that. Uh, okay, so for the edge onset, so the chemical shift here, the titanium did not shift and the strontium titanate did shift a little bit. And so we have this extra peak. We leave that like that. And okay, if you were ahead of me, that's good. Uh, so we do the peak fit widget. Again, uh, 
you want to see exactly how far, so something like 600 or so EV, be good. And we do a peak finding. Let's look at something like seven. And if we do now a peak fit, find them, <clears throat> we get automatically um, the ratio of the L2, L3 ratio. L2 to L3 should have been 0.5, but effectively it is 1.64. So this is due to the um, symmetry of the titanium atom in this octahedral site. But what's really important is, and much more quantitative, is the sum of the two peaks, the L2 and the L3 peaks. So there was a question about that. Uh, the L2 peak is the one from the lower energy uh, core state. So that is a 2P one half, uh, and it's called L2. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> it's historic, but basically they didn't know where these edges come from and they just started in the middle of the uh, alphabet. So, uh, and the oxidation states are actually the <clears throat> number of electrons that are transferred from the titanium to the oxygen. So the oxidation state here is two. And this oxidation state is directly related to the sum of the two. So that's how many empty D states there are, because you basically empty the D states um, to the oxygen. And so you have more D states. So a titanium uh, metal will have a lower total sum. Uh, and depending on what kind of environment it is, it's probably also closer to one in the metal titanium. We can check out what kind of peaks we got. They are associated with the L2 and L3. So we have four peaks here. Let's look at them. We have the time, we have four more minutes. So we have the difference, right? We have here our peaks. Uh, titanium dioxide has deformed uh, octahedral sites for the titanium. So this second peak here splits. So the splitting here is due to the crystal field splitting of the perfect octahedral site in strontium titanate. Uh, and if you have two, if you have deformed or distorted octahedra, then the second peak is crystal field splitting. Uh, you have two crystal field splittings and the second peak is splitting in two peaks. Uh, we don't have that in strontium titanate. Uh, we have this four peaks here for the wide lines. So we have the crystal field splitting, which we can read off here. So we have the L3 and L3. So we have 460 and 458.7. So that would be 2.2 EV and 2.3 EV for the other one. So within our accuracy, the crystal field splitting is the same as it should be. Uh, and if we just do our smoothing, uh, we get a good representation of that. And with uh, then, since we have fitted a lot of peaks into that, we can check how many, uh, which ones are relevant, and we get a direct. Uh, so the L2 should have less intensity. Uh, than the L3, but it usually does not. And that is due to this um, symmetry part. If you want to know more about it, uh, 
Schwartz did some simulations of the titanium LH, and uh, he explains it uh, extremely well based on uh, GW calculations. Um, if you have any of this analysis, and of course you want to save it, and uh, then you have. Uh, hmm. Okay, we cannot do that, obviously. Now we can only save it to this part, and we have um, saved it here, and we can open that again, and all the analysis is uh, uh, preserved including where you got what, so where, what did you use for your calibration of the intensity and so on. So this is the amount of data you can get out of an eel spectrum. The next one will be how to uh, do that with quantum. Okay, so no new questions. I'm not sure how many more people we had here. So maybe we have some other. Questions? Okay, everybody is completely well, done. So we have not more questions and I want to end that with that. Again, quantification is not extremely hard. The main thing is getting some kind of idea of what your uh, incoming intensity is, and then you can do all the analysis quantitatively with a model-based uh, system. So thank you all, and uh, I talk to you on uh, next Tuesday, and Rama is talking about machine learning and spectra on Friday. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. Stop sharing. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Where am I here? Okay. Yep. And